This is the eighth and final lecture on the book of 1 Corinthians, and we have so much to cover uh, during this tape. It's like I said at the beginning of the lecture, or actually, I mean, at the beginning of the Liberty Home Bible Institute course, we had so much to cover during that two years and all these tapes. It would be like trying to get a, a zebra in a 7-up bottle. I don't know if we'll get him all in or not, but I do want to finish up the subject of the tongue movement and the tongue doctrine as described in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And this is so important because, as uh, I have said before, with the possible exception of predestination, I don't know of any uh, subject that has caused more confusion and heartache than has the, has the um, movement of the modern tongue movement, the subject of the modern tongue movement. Now, in your notes, you'll have the uh, various important dates in church history concerning tongues after the uh, resurrection of Christ and after the completion of the canon. Uh, two of these dates are very important. Uh, one is January the 1st, 1901, uh, in, during this century, and at that time a student in the Bethel Bible College at Topeka, Kansas, Kansas, uh, by the name of Agnes Osman, uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She spoke in tongues, and this date here in January is regarded by many today as the birthday of modern Pentecostalism. Because, as we've already noted in your notes, I didn't bring this out, but in your notes you'll see that prior to this time, prior to the 20th century, you find little or practically no mention of tongues throughout church history, except in a bad light, but from the 20th century on, then you find it. And so January the 1st, and then the next important day is uh, April the 3rd, 1960. And on that day, it was a Sunday morning, uh, Father Dennis Bennett, who is rector of a large Episcopalian church in Van Nuys, California, announced to his congregation, uh, this is an Episcopalian priest now, that he had spoken in tongues. And I remember reading about that, and, and of course nationwide publicity followed. Time magazine and Life and Look, those magazines were published in those days, and, and Newsweek and and I believe U.S. News and Roll Report and Cosmopolitan and every newspaper and every magazine uh, in the world, I think, uh, at least uh, it was interested in, in uh, religion in America, covered uh, that uh, momentous announcement. And because of this nationwide publicity, this date thus marks the beginning of the modern charismatic movement. All right, now... Uh, we've looked at some of the biblical uh, mentions of the word tongues found in, as I say, in five different places in the New Testament. Uh, what about the views on tongues? Of course, there's no universal agreement in either uh, the camp of the pro or anti-tongue movement concerning the exact nature of New Testament tongue speaking. And by the way, students, this is apparently the reason why there's so much confusion today, because we not only uh, argue sometimes over the fact of whether the gift is for today, uh, but there's a real problem as to what the original gift was. A few years ago, I found myself seated at a religious breakfast uh, next to uh, Oral Roberts, and I had a chance to meet him and just talk with him a little bit, and so we uh, shared pleasantries and really didn't get into a doctrinal study, but uh, had I talked to him about the subject of healing, uh, we would have obviously differed whether the gift of healing is for today. Roberts would have said, yes, I believe it is. Obviously, he'd have to say that, and I would say, I don't think it is for today, through a man, that is. Uh, but at least we would have agreed on what the original gift was. The original gift, of course, was the supernatural ability to heal uh, diseased minds and bodies. Uh, but uh, if we would have, dis we didn't discuss that, and we didn't discuss tongues either. He, I would, I'm sure, speaks in tongues, but if we had discussed the subject of tongues, we probably couldn't come to any 
agreement at all, not only uh, concerning what, whether the gift was for today, but what was the original gift. And see, that's the problem. You have two questions before you can arrive at an answer concerning the subject of tongues. Now, uh, number one, what was the original gift of speaking in tongues? There's two main theories. Number one, uh, that the original gift is the supernatural ability to speak in previously unlearned human languages. And uh, most fundamentalists probably would hold that position. Uh, men like Dr. John Walverd and, and uh, other uh, men that we could call uh, attention to would believe that this is the uh, gift of tongues, the ability for me, perhaps, as an Englishman, to suddenly uh, start preaching in uh, the French language or the Germanic language, um, in a language concerning the plan of salvation that I have previously not learned. So that would be the, the gift according to some. But there are others that would say, oh no, no, that's not the gift at all. Uh, the gift of tongues is the supernatural ability uh, to speak in non-earthly language, angelic language, language that has no earthly basis. Now, I know Pentecostal preachers and theologians that hold both of these positions. There are some that believe it is simply the ability to speak in previously unlearned human languages. There are others that believe it is ability to speak in angelic languages. There are theologians who hold to both positions. That is to say, they say, well, it, the gift involved both. Not, you don't have to choose between one or the other. So what I'm saying is this, uh, that uh, uh, one of the reasons why there's so much confusion and uh, which leads to corruption today in this movement is that we really do not have an absolute, at least in the minds of many, uh, black and white uh, description in the Bible of what the original gift of tongues really was. As far as my position is concerned, I, I would almost think that, that uh, the gift was twofold. It did seem in 1 uh, Corinthians 14 to refer to the ability to speak in non-human languages, but then in Acts chapter 2, uh, I mean angelic languages, of course, and then Acts 2, though, it decidedly the passage there infers that the gift was regarded itself with the ability to speak in unlearned human languages. So I'm not quite sure where I stand either on the original gift of tongues, the nature of it. Of course, uh, I think the, the evidence uh, the cir uh, is uh, overwhelming. It's circumstantial, perhaps, but as one uh, looks at the pages of the New Testament, especially from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 on, uh, he uh, will come to conclusion, if he's an honest scholar of the Bible, and a thorough scholar of the Word of God, that the gift of tongues, whatever it was 2,000 years ago, has since been phased out because we now have the completed canon of the Word of God. All right, well, whatever the purpose, uh, whatever the nature of tongues were in the original uh, church uh, period. What was the purpose of tongues? Let us list several things. It was not for, number one, it was not for, for church edification. Paul brings this out in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says that I had uh, rather speak in a church. He said in... Uh, uh, a known language far more than he said on an unknown language. In fact, in this particular uh, chapter, chapter 14, verse 19, he says that he would rather speak five words uh, with his understanding uh, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So it might indirectly edify the church, but it was not basically for church edification. We'll get into a minute what the gift was actually for. All right. Secondly, I do not feel it was for church edification. Well, wait a minute. Somebody says, now look, and I mean for personal edification. 
Now, there are a number of people that do not speak in tongues publicly, but they do it privately. They say, look, I don't get up and interrupt a sermon and make a fool of myself, and why, that's just crazy people do that. Uh, I speak in tongues in my closet at home, and I get close to God, and no one's around, and there's not a lot of emotion involved, etc., not a lot of noise or, or babbling, and I don't froth at the mouth, but, but I do it to edify myself because the Scripture says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 14, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Well, how can I make the statement then? On the basis of that, it was not for personal edification. Maybe I should say it this way. It should not be for personal edification. Because you have a problem here. If tongues were for personal edification to really build one up in the faith, and if the, the church house was filled with tongue speaking, in other words, if most of the people uh, spoke in tongues and in Corinth, and the context definitely indicates this in verse 23, chapter 14, then how do we explain the fact that apart from the church in Laodicea, in Revelation 3, this group at Corinth was the most carnal and confused and corrupted church in the entire New Testament? No, I think Paul may have been saying here he may have been rebuking them. He said, look, you're using this gift for personal edification, but you should not use it for personal edification. God has given me perhaps the gift of teaching, the gift of preaching. I am not to use that gift for self-edification. I, I am to edify others, and then I in turn am to be edified by the gifts of others as they pass their gifts my way. But it's a two-way street, you see. And maybe Paul is saying this, uh, you're using this, he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. You're using, you're using this gift to build yourself up with, and you should not do it. All right? Now, thirdly, tongue speaking was not to demonstrate spirit baptism. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 that every single repenting sinner has been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So tongue speaking, whatever it was for, it was not for church edification, basically. It was not for personal edification, and it was not to demonstrate spirit baptism. What then was the purpose of tongues in the New Testament? And we have a number of reasons listed here you can read for yourself. Number one, to validate the authority of the apostles and early Christians. We've already talked about that, uh, where Peter and John uh, call on this fellow. You remember, they say they take their, uh, they're led by Christ to go out and, and do the census. And so it was to validate the fact that the apostles really were from God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it was, I believe... One of the purposes of tongues was to demonstrate God's judgment upon unbelieving Israel. Uh, you see, uh, God told them in the book of Isaiah, and this is quoted here, Paul quotes this in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, he says, all right, uh, you um, Israeli believers in the Old Testament, he said, uh, you won't accept my warning through my prophet Isaiah and, and later on through Jeremiah and Ezekiel when they speak in clear uh, sound Hebrew to you to repent you re ridicule that so I'll then speak to you in non-Hebrew language in Babylonian language and in Assyrian language foreign language and, of course, later on, the Assyrian G.I. Joes captured the northern kingdom. And then after that, the Babylonian soldiers came, and they captured the southern kingdom. So God spoke to his people who would not listen through the mouths of their own Hebrew prophets. Then he spoke to them in judgment through the mouths of enemy soldiers uh, as they captured the north and south the northern southern kingdom. 
So for God to address his people in a different language apart from the Hebrew language uh, in the Bible is indicative of judgment. And so the tongue movement or the tongue gift perhaps was in part to demonstrate God's judgment upon unbelieving Israel. Then it was to serve as a sign to seeking but lost individual Jews. So he would drive away uh, the unrepentant Jews, but it would draw to Christ the believing Jews because this would be a supernatural sign to, to bring them to Christ. It was a sign gift, no doubt about that, to call their attention to the fact that something supernatural was taking place. Remember, Nicodemus uh, came to Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So Nicodemus uh, was drawn to Christ because of the miracles that he did, and he said, I realize you must be from God or you couldn't do these miracles. All right, and then I think uh, the, one of the most important reasons for the original gift of tongues, and that certainly ties into the question that we could ask right now, our tongues for today, is this. The purpose of tongues was to impart new truths prior to the completion of the canon. Because, you see, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 14, and that's really the great uh, passage on the subject of tongues, about 90, 85 to 90 percent of the New Testament had not yet been written. And uh, so a uh, purpose of tongues, uh, God could use that gift as he used dreams and visions in order to impart and to transmit new revelations to his people. But then with the completion of the canon, there was no more need of new revelations because the canon was completed. And if there was no more need of future revelations, then there would be no need of the subject of tongues. So uh, that argument uh, that uh, some say, well, if uh, Jesus used to give the gift of tongues and he doesn't today, uh, then the Bible is wrong when it says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, Jesus, for six hours on one occasion, hung on a cross, but he's not hanging on a cross today, and that doesn't mean that he's not the same. Now, that statement in the book of Hebrews doesn't mean that he's always going to do everything that he once did. He's going to continually do that, but it simply means that morally, and as far as his faithfulness and his eternality and his grace and his love, Jesus Christ never changes. He himself never changes, but... But when he said on the cross, it is finished, he meant he, would, he had come to do a job and that job was now done and he wasn't going to be on the cross any longer. And we could almost say the same thing with the completion of the canon. Uh, the Spirit of God said concerning the subject of tongues, it is finished because he had utilized to the glory of God and to the good of the elect that gift that he had given man during the early days of church history for these four purposes. All right, now, the regulation of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. We have a long list here of uh, rules that had to be obeyed, according to Paul, if one desired to speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues, Paul said in verse 3 and 4, helps no Christian in the church, but speaking in a known tongue helps all believers. The tongue, like a musical instrument, is useless unless heard and distinctly understood. This distinction can sometimes, verse 8, mean the difference between life and death. Although Paul is said to have spoken in tongues, there is no stress on this whatsoever during any of his testimonies, as before Felix and Agrippa, or missionary trips. Now, he does give his testimony on a number of occasions, four different occasions. The Damascus Road, how I got saved, and I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision, etc. But he never mentions his tongue-speaking experiences. Now, Paul did not forbid the speaking of tongues in this chapter, and he should not forbid it, of course, because the gift was still in existence. But he did not especially encourage it. Because Paul realized that not all Christians, not even during those days, had the gift. 
in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, our charismatic friends ought to read that carefully because there it says that uh, do all have the gift of tongues? No. Do all, do all uh, have the, the, the miracles of healing? No. So not all have the same gifts. And even though the gift was for today, uh, then it would be wrong to uh, ask people to speak in tongues. I just like saying, well, now, if you're really close to the Lord, you'll receive the gift of evangelism. Or if you really do what God wants you to do and have a tearing service, then you'll automatically receive the gift of the pastor-teacher. No, God has not called all men to be pastors and teachers, even though the gift of pastoring is for today. He doesn't call everybody to do that. And when the gift was in existence, not everybody spoke in tongues. So therefore, the teaching today that all Christians must speak in tongues for salvation or for sanctification is both wicked and it's totally unscriptural. All right, now, uh, one final thing on chapter 14 here, uh, verses 34 and 35. And this is something that will really, uh, I should say, uh, not will really, because apparently people don't look at it this way, but should really explode the modern charismatic movement into a million pieces. Verse 34, women, women were absolutely forbidden to speak in tongues. And I venture to say that 90% of those who participate in the tongue movement today are the female gender. And we have, as a bottom line here, in the light of the above, all honest observers would have to admit <clears throat> that approximately 90% of the modern tongue movement would immediately fall if the rules in 1 Corinthians 14 were obeyed. And now the $64 billion question, the cessation of tongues. Has tongues ceased? And I think there's a massive amount of evidence and information which strongly supports the conclusion that the biblical gift of tongues had ceased by the end of the first century. For example, tongues are never mentioned by Paul again after 1 Corinthians 14. Now you stop thinking about that. Uh, Paul wrote at least 13, I think he wrote the book of Hebrews, so that's 14 epistles. All right, now most people think that, theologians now believe, that Galatians was the first epistle he wrote. So that was written by this time. Okay, and then 1st and 2nd Thessalonians would be the 2nd and 3rd, so that's 3. 1st Corinthians would be the 4th. Now he hasn't even finished the 4th of 14 epistles and that he's going to write. And yet, in 1 Corinthians 14, beyond that, you never find him mentioning the subject of tongues again in all the remaining ten epistles that he'll write. And he covers every other important doctrine, but he never once mentions it to the Ephesian church, the Colossian church, the church at Rome, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, preachers he writes to, to, to Timothy and to Titus, surely he should tell them about it, but he doesn't. Another thing, the remaining New Testament writers, Peter, James, John, Jude, never once mention the gift. Another thing, tongues are not mentioned as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. It lists a lot of other things, but it does not mention the gift of tongues. And then tongues are not in the list of qualifications for a pastor or a deacon in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1. If it's so important, certainly God would want a pastor or at least some pastors and some deacons to have this gift, but it's not mentioned as a prerequisite. And there's no reference of tongues in Christ's final message to his churches in Revelation 2 and 3. He rebukes them and exhorts them and encourages them concerning many issues, but he never mentions, never, the subject of tongues. So, uh, putting all this together, I think the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming that tongues ceased when the Apostle Paul uh, cleaned his pen 
and returned it to its resting place after writing the final chapter, Revelation chapter 22. From that point on, then, the Apostle Paul's words would ru rule the day, where Paul said, All Scripture, at this time it was completed now, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, or the woman, or the boy, or the girl of God, might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So, as I take that statement literally, and I do take it literally, then I don't need a vision, I don't need an angel to appear to me, I don't need some emotional experience. All I need, according to the Bible now, to be perfectly equipped for that job that God has given me in the ministry, that race, part of the race that I'm to run, all I need is a knowledge, a working knowledge of the Word of God. And this is one of the reasons why I am 100% against the modern charismatic tongue movement, because it says the Bible is not enough. I've mentioned this before. There are two theories today, two practices, I should say, philosophies that have done untold damage to the cause of Christ. And most, uh, many, I should say most, but many Bible believers espouse one or both of these positions. Number one is theistic evolution, and that says that the Bible is not scientific. And the other position is that of the charismatic movement, and that says that the Bible is not sufficient. One says it's not scientific. You have to look to Darwin to give you the answer. The other says it's not sufficient. It's as good as far as it goes, but you need other visions and you need other experiences and other revelations. So I categorically reject both, and you should also. All right, now the uh, last phase of the tongue movement study here. Uh, we have this sentence, an analysis of modern day tongues. We try to list some of the reasons why people speak in tongues. Of course, we cannot judge the action, uh, the attitude behind the action. We can say the action is not of God. Now, we do not know what prompts that action. I believe many sincere people, many saved people, and up to a certain point many spiritual people speak in tongues. And I would not doubt the spirituality or the salvation or the sincerity of any one who speaks in tongues. I simply say that it is not of God. It may be a very honest and sincere effort to please God but it is not of God. Now, it may be satanic. I don't know what prompts it. See, it's uh, a lot easier to say something is not of God than to say it's of the devil. It may not be of the devil. It simply may be a sincere effort to please God, and, and uh, God will, I'm sure, compensate for that and give the sincere seeker a little information later on. So we would not condemn into everlasting hell, obviously, anyone who speaks in tongues. But we're saying that according to our definition or according to our understanding of the Word of God, the tongue movement is not of the Lord. All right, uh, we've spent uh, perhaps too much time here in this sixth gift of the 18 gifts, the gift of tongues, but I really don't think that you can over-exaggerate the harm uh, that and the confusion that that uh, modern tongue movement has caused. The gift of tongue interpretation. Uh, of course, this is a little easier to define than the gift of tongues itself because this gift was the supernatural ability to clarify and to translate those messages spoken in tongues, whether they be angelic or non-human language. It was the ability to, to translate, really, and that's basically what the gift of tongue interpretation was. It was the gift to translate. And then the eighth gift, the gift of wisdom. 
This uh, very possibly is tied in to the writing of the Bible. We're not absolutely sure what the gift of wisdom was, but uh, we have it down here, a suggestion here, the supernatural ability to rightly apply both human and divine knowledge. All right, and then there, number nine, the gift of spirit discernment. This is the ability to distinguish between demonic, human, and divine works, and sometimes people. Peter and uh, Paul had this gift. And, you know, in the ministry, I have talked to a number of pastors and, of course, being in the ministry myself, and, and I think that uh, God graciously and maybe mercifully gives many pastors' wives this gift of discernment. I don't know about you, Pastor, if you're listening to my voice, but my wife is a good deal smarter than I am. She's a better judge of people in a local church. And sometimes I'll say, well, that fellow's got what it takes, and he's really going to do something for the Lord, and I can use him as a deacon or an usher. And she said, well, let's give him a little more time. I'm just not sure. He, he may have some maturing to, to do. And invariably, uh, she's right. Or I'll say, well, you know, I don't think that fellow, I just don't think I can use uh, him, or I don't think I'd like to appoint her as a nursery worker, but I just don't think that I can depend on her. What do you think, honey? Oh, no, listen, I've talked to her, and I think if you gave her a certain amount of responsibility and encouraged her, I think she'd do the job for you. And uh, I found out that when I listen to my wife, uh, I usually uh, I do the right thing. So my wife has more spiritual discernment, I think, than what I do, and I found this to be the testimony of many pastors, the gift of spirit discernment. And then the gift of giving. Men like R.G. Letourneau, of course, and other men have that gift of uh, the ability to accumulate and to give large sums of money to God's glory. I always wish I had that gift, and uh, God couldn't trust me with it, though. Uh, at least to give large sums of money. The gift of exhortation. Uh, the staff members at Thomas Road believe that Jerry has this gift, perhaps above all other gifts, of exhortation, the ability to deliver challenging words. And then the gift of ministering or the gift of helps and how this is needed in a local church. The gift of mercy showing. This is the supernatural ability to minister to sick and afflicted people. Some people in your congregation can go hospital visiting and they can walk into a room and just sort of turn on the light spiritually with it, with them, and other people, they'll turn the light off. I mean, uh, the patient will feel uh, so much better when somebody visits him and somebody else comes in, and, and uh, if he's not sick before the fellow comes in, he is after the fellow leaves. So the gift of mercy showing. And then the gift of ruling or the gift of administration. And again, at Thomas Road, we really needed that gift. A few years ago, we had a, got into a financial problem. And I think it's basically, as I look back now, we did not develop those believers in our local church that had the gift of ruling or the gift of administration. Now, back in those days, we literally fulfilled that passage of Scripture that says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And we didn't, and so we inadvertently got into a financial problem. The gift of faith, number 15 here. Uh, this is not saving faith because all repenting sinners have that, and it is not sanctifying faith because all Christians have that gift to grow in grace and faith. Uh, but this is stewardship faith, and this is the faith that uh, George Mueller had and others. And then the gift of teaching, the ability to communicate and clarify the details of the Word of God. Uh, the gift of evangelism. Now, this does not mean that believers are not to witness unless they have this gift. All believers are commanded to witness, but there are some uh, that have the supernatural ability uh, to uh, major in soul winning, and others do not have that ability. That is to say, God blesses them in other areas, but we're all to win souls. We need to make that clear. And then the gift of the pastor-teacher, and this is the supernatural ability to preach and teach the Word of God and feed and lead the flock of God. The gift of pastor-teacher, now notice, this is the only double portion gift of the 18 gifts, and thus all teachers are not called to be pastors, 
but all pastors are to be teachers. And if you're a pastor and you say, well, you know, I don't even like to teach a Sunday school class because I don't have the gift of teaching at all. Now, there's two things involved here, uh, two conclusions. Number one, you're not called to be a pastor either, or you just haven't uh, developed your gift of teaching because, brother, if you're called a pastor of that church, you're also given the gift of teaching. You may have to cultivate it and develop it and organize it and maybe even discover it, uh, but you've got it. We just don't have very much time left at all, and, and what I do want to, to get into for a few minutes is the greatest chapter in the entire Bible, probably 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I have just about 10 minutes left to do that, so we're going to skip over 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13. I have uh, in my notes... Uh, I think a pretty good description of this chapter. And uh, by the way, let me just say about chapter 13, that's the greatest love poem in the history of the world. And Paul the Apostle was chosen by God to write that love poem. You know, today we often hear this untrue statement. Well, you know, you can't really mix love and theology. And if you're going to be a theologian and you're going to take a strong stand for Christ in a local church area a situation, then you've got to sort of be careful lest you get bogged down with the sentimental love of the liberals. And you can't mix love and theology. And the, the, and the liberals, they're guilty of the same error. They say, well, you know, no creed but Christ, no law but love, and and uh, there's far more uh, that unites them than, than that divides us, so we won't even discuss doctrine. Just love and no doctrine. You see, doctrine divides, but love unites. Now, that's garbage. The greatest theologian in the history of the world was the Apostle Paul. And God chose him to write the greatest love poem in the history of of the world. I wouldn't have chosen Paul. I would have chosen John the Apostle. John, that's more to your forte. Or, or maybe uh, even Simon Peter. Or Barnabas. I probably would have picked Barnabas. God chose the theologian to write about the love. He chose the, uh, the man with the brain to write a poem that expressed the feelings of his heart. You see. So, the great love poem. And that really... That poem is the mortar that holds the 18 bricks of the gifts of the Spirit in chapters 12 and 14 all together. Now, in chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. This is one of the longest chapters in the Bible. And as I said, uh, putting right up there with Romans 8, it is the greatest of the 1100 and... Uh, 89 chapters in the Word of God. And what I've done in my notes here, I've attempted to uh, pick 10 peas in a pod here and give you the following outline. It's about the resurrection, chapter 15. The prominence of the resurrection, verses 1 to 4. The proof of the resurrection, verses 5 to 11. The priority, verses 12 to 19. And then also verses 29 to 32. The parade of the resurrection, the plea of the resurrection, the pattern, the perfection, the promise, the purpose, and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what about the resurrection? Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and in which ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." So the prominence of the resurrection, the fact of Christ's resurrection, he rose again, the time element in Christ's resurrection, he rose again on the third day, and the reason for the resurrection of Christ, he rose again for our sins. 
You know, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the real sign and symbol of the Christian faith is not the cross. It is the empty tomb, the prominence of the resurrection. And then you have the proof of the resurrection. The New Testament records at least ten appearances of the resurrected Christ. Here the Apostle Paul refers to four. Now, these ten you have listed here, and I think you have other notes also in the Liberty Home Bible Institute course. But uh, on one occasion, the Bible says that he appeared unto at least 500 brethren. And here Paul brings this out. At least 500 brethren at one time. Now, our Jehovah Witness friends say that when Christ came in 1914, he came and no one saw him but a few Jehovah Witnesses. But that's not what the Scripture says, that when Christ did something, everybody knew about it, or at least hundreds of people knew about it. The proof of the resurrection. There is as much evidence, historically as well as um, biblically, to uh, document the resurrection of Jesus Christ as there is to document the existence of a Julius Caesar. And then you have the priority of the resurrection. In Paul's day, as in our own time, there were those who denied the subject of the resurrection in general. And uh, they had many theories to try to explain this away. But Paul said, all right, if Christ be not raised again from the dead, then he said, we of all men are most miserable. So the priority of the resurrection is this, that the faith of the Christian rises or falls upon his literal acceptance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this little poem, If Christ be not divine, then lay the book away, and every blessed faith resign that has so long been yours and mine through many a trying day. Forget the place of bended knee, and dream no more of worlds to be. If Christ be not divine, go seal again the tomb. Take down the cross, redemption's sign. Quench all the stars of hope that shine. Forget the upper room. And let us turn and travel on across a night that has no dawn. Now notice, number four, the parade of the resurrection. The resurrection is a form of parade. There's three parts to this parade. First of all, the resurrection of Christ. And that occurred 2,000 years ago, of course. Every man in his own order, Paul says. Christ the first fruits, And then afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. So the middle part of this parade then will be the rapture resurrection. And then finally, he says, then cometh the end. So bringing up the rear of this resurrection parade will be the premillennial resurrection of Old Testament and tribulational saints. So you have the first part of the parade. It's a threefold parade. Christ himself, the middle part, the rapture resurrected saints, and then the last part, the uh, tribulational saints, and uh, that will be raised after the tribulation and before the millennium. Number E, the plea of the resurrection. The Bible says, Paul says, we are to awake to righteousness and sin not. We are to avoid those who deny the resurrection. What fellowship hath light with darkness? Then the pattern of the resurrection. And Paul here uses as an illustration a grain of seed. You put a grain of seed in the ground, it dies, and then it, it doesn't die, really, because it comes forth, dies to self, but later on it sprouts forth and blooms in newness of life. Thus will the resurrected body do. And then the promise of the resurrection. The promise of the resurrection is in the form of a mystery. I show you a mystery, and here's the promise that someday believers will get to heaven without dying, will receive glorified bodies without going through the valley shadow of death. The purpose of the resurrection is this, 
for mortal bodies to put on immortality and for dead bodies to put on incorruption. So you have then the purpose of the, of the resurrection and then the power of the resurrection. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And then you finally have, well, I guess that's it. I've gone through these ten, the prominence, the proof, the priority, the parade, the plea, the pattern, the perfection, and you have the promise, the purpose, and the power. Let me quote here. I have about a half a minute left from a song that I love to hear sung, Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen as he said, never since the heavens rang with the song the angels sang on the morning of his birth had such gladness come to earth quickly were the tidings spread christ is risen from the dead